Hey guys, it is Saturday, August 10th, and I wanted to do a quick uh, economic history uh, review on the history of money printing. Uh, inspired by Jeffrey Tucker's um, uh, interview with uh, Prof. St. Ange, I wanted to do a little bit of a recap of the last hundred years of money printing. So I started this, I got interrupted, and so I'm going to try it again. And here we go. I got a uh, presentation for you guys. All right, so, uh, and of course, as usual, if you like my YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. I uh, really appreciate it. Okay, so um, let's go back to money printing, the history of the last hundred years. Okay, so in our story starts in 1914 and uh, the beginning of World War I. And by this time, central banking is in place worldwide. Um, uh, and it is in place worldwide, and it is um, it it started with the Bank of England in 1694. Then Napoleon started the Bank of France in 1800. Uh, the Russian Bank was started in 1860, and uh, 16 years later, we have the German Reichsbank that was created, and finally the Federal Reserve in 1913. So. The stage is now set. All the major powers have central banks. All of them have the ability to print money and finance uh, a carnage on a scale that we have never seen. Um, before that, they wanted to do big wars, but they just couldn't afford them. Nobody wanted to lend them the money to make these wars. So this was the really first ginormous war, and it was funded by all these central banks. Um, so what happened? Uh, well, uh, um, the Allies won, and um, the Allies won, and once the war was over, of course, uh, Germany was saddled with reparations. And uh, basically, the idea of the British and the French were, we'll make these Germans pay for the next fifty years uh, for all the uh, uh, the trouble uh, that they've inflicted on us, and. And they're going to help us also pay from all the money that we borrowed from the Americans. Um, so the Americans weren't necessarily opposed to this because uh, they wanted the British to repay them. So there was a little bit of a daisy chain. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the new tech, which was this money printer, was used to print marks and then buy pounds and francs to pay the French and the uh, British. Uh, and at first this was a very successful. This worked. Um, and in 1920... There was a boom in Germany, uh, and everybody thought they'd solve this problem. Uh, they were just going to print money, um, much like politicians today think they were going to do. But 1923, however, the economy was in complete shambles. Uh, the mark was worthless and paving the way for, of course, Hitler. Um, now, uh, seven years later in the U.S., we had now gone into a deep depression, right? So... Uh, this was started, of course, by the 1929 panic, um, but it was also, uh, at that time, the, Europe was selling U.S. dollars to get gold out of, because the U.S. dollar was backed by gold, so they were selling U.S. dollars to get gold, and the Americans were very concerned about uh, all the selling of U.S. dollars, so they tightened interest rates to protect the dollar and imposed, at the same time, imposed tariffs to protect American industries. Um, so the combination of these high rates and these tariffs basically choked off America and made sure that we weren't going to recover from the stock market panic. And uh, this led directly into uh, FDR. So the response was FDR took over in 1933 and just started spending like crazy on public works, added all kinds of uh, legislation, including the uh, SEC, which was uh, at that time um, run by his uh, one of his benefactors, Joe Kennedy, which is one of the richest and most corrupt people in the United States, uh, one of the smartest too. Uh, so, you know, he started this, and uh, nine years later, the U.S. entered the war. Right. So, you know, it is debatable whether FDR even uh, uh, did anything other than just stabilize the U U.S. economy. But the GDP certainly went up as measured um, in statistics, 
but not individual wealth, as Jeffrey Tucker points out. You know, it's there was still rationing. You you had to you could only get a certain amount of lard per per week. Um, so it, it wasn't like people were getting rich. It was just the entire economy was turned into a war funding effort. Okay, and um, after the war, however, uh, we had you know two and a half decades of very hard money. Right, it's like three decades almost. And um, this was under the Bretton Woods Agreement, where even though gold was forbidden to own by private Americans, uh, fiat was tied to gold for international payments. And uh, meanwhile, Germany had very, very tight money under the new uh, Bundesbank. And so both Germany and the U.S. did fantastic in this, uh, in this uh, scenario, right? Um, uh, and we rebuilt the world, and we had this this great hard money uh, system, and it, we we paid down this monstrous debt that we had accumulated uh, in um, in World War Two. Now, uh, by the we did a U turn, and and by at 1971 was sort of the the bottom of the U turn, and uh, in 1971 Nixon pulled off the gold standard to help uh, pay for the Vietnam War. We started printing money like crazy. Inflation, of course, skyrocketed. Rates skyrocketed as Paul Volcker tried to stabilize the situation. And and the U.S. balance sheet just expanded, exploded, right? We went from 30% debt to GDP to where we are now, which is 120% debt to GDP. Now, within this new global economic system, we had three great dec- decades, right? And, uh, you know, Japan was a great beneficiary for the first decade, you know, of this and, and, and from the previous time too. But from 1980 to 1990, Japan just did fantastic. And it looked like they were going to take over the world. Um, of course, they collapsed in 1990. Uh, again, they had massive over-financialization, cross-share ownership, um, and, uh, you know, from 1990 on, there was just massive government intervention. Um, you know, the government just sort of doing new, new deal type strategies times 10, um, buying back their, their equities, buying back their debt, um, doing everything they could to save the uh, system. And, of course, sort of China took over the narrative of growth uh, from Japan um, starting in 1990. So that's, that's that. And, of course, in 2008, the entire financial system almost broke, right? And, again, the solution to this, uh, uh, you know, under Bernanke was more money printing. So we had QE, QE2, QE3, QE Infinity. Um, and this benefited tech companies tremendously. Um, so large cap tech, Amazon, Apple, et cetera, were able to borrow super, super cheap uh, and this happened to be at a, a, at a point where they really could use the money to build out their their, um, their platforms. And so we had this just ginormous boom in these companies, um, and which has led us to where we are today with these fangs. Uh, under COVID, of course, it got even worse. Uh, the money, money printer went on overdrive. Um and again, Janet Yellen and, and the Fed said, this is just transitory. We're not, gonna, we're not in an inflationary environment. Of course, we were. This did cause inflation. And all the subsidies of COVID and more were destroyed by inflation. And, you know, this really, as, as, um, as Tucker explained, that, you know, all this stuff is these GDP numbers cannot be trusted. Not, none of these numbers are trusted. What's clear is that the whole thing was just a destruction of wealth. The subsidies and everything was a destruction. And, um, and, and, and it, it just ended up being a, a theft of people's money. And we're sort of realizing that just about now. And, of course, China is itself a massive bubble. We have entire empty cities now. We have money printing on a level that even eclipses the U.S., and we don't know. We have no statistics. There's information suppression. So, again, we have this problem of we, we can't trust anything. 
Uh, so what are the lessons from all this? Well, the lessons are when you have money printers, you tend to have wars and wars require money printing. Um, money printing always does cause inflation. Uh, it, it may not cause it immediately. It may take, there may be a lag. There may be a couple year lag like there was in Germany, like there was in the U.S., but it always does cause inflation. It also causes subpar economic growth, right? So it, it's not terrible for everybody. It's for the richest people in Germany and the richest, biggest companies in Germany in the 20s. They did fantastic under the, the hyperinflation. Uh, the tech companies, uh, the FANGs, did great under, um, under COVID, right? Um, so it, it, it tend, there's this cant cantillon effect, and it tends to benefit certain people. It absolutely does not benefit anybody who's working class or, the, or who's a sort of saver in their currency. They just get destroyed. And uh, the last lesson is government intervention doesn't work. You know, you can, you can try to... You can try to regulate this stuff. It doesn't work. You can try to buy back your own bonds. That doesn't work. You can try to raise interest rates to stop people from going into your... That doesn't work. Uh, you can try to do tariffs. That doesn't work. So government intervention doesn't work because the solution to all this is hard money. Um, that's the solution, right? That's what works. And so right now, the solution is Bitcoin. Uh, it's 15 years old. It has a $1.2 trillion market cap. And it's on its way to becoming the new world money standard. And so that's my opinion anyways. I'm going to stick to it. And I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed my presentation. I'm going to put the slides online. And uh, and thanks. And again, if you, uh, if you follow me on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And um, we'll see you soon.